Welcome to Darren Batchelder's Real Estate Investing Show. Each week, you will learn how to grow your wealth through real estate investing, be introduced to the players that are getting it done, and learn how you can get involved. And now, here's your host, Darren Batchelder. Hello, everyone. Today, we have a very special guest. We've got MJ DeMarco. He is a best-selling author, and I am so excited for today. MJ, appreciate you coming on the show. What's up, Darren? Great to, great to be here. Thanks for the invite. A absolutely. So um, a little bit on how I know MJ. I actually read his book, um, The Millionaire Fast Lane. He's got three books out. The Millionaire Fast Lane was his, his first one, and it I'm just going to tell you guys, you, you should be reading this book. Um, it was a recommendation from another apartment syndicator in the Dallas area, Aaron Katz. And um, he put that out on his Facebook. And I was going on vacation. I picked a few books to bring with me. And that was one of them. And, and it's a great book because it's, it's all about talking about wealth building. And real estate is one of those avenues that you could build tremendous wealth, but there's also a lot of other ways. So with that, um, MJ, appreciate you coming on. One, one thing I typically would ask is how many properties and how many units you're invested in, but you're not a pure real estate guy. You're, you're a best-selling author. So um, why don't I kind of change it up a little bit and ask you how many copies have you sold uh, with your books? Well, to be honest, I have no idea. You have no I, idea. I, I, I have never counted. I, I have never logged into a, a service to see how much I've sold. Um, if I had a guess, it would probably be well over a million um, cumulatively around the, uh, around the globe. Uh, it's been translated in 25 languages all over the, all of the planet. Uh, and it's quite interesting because you are more likely to find... Uh, my book, The Millionaire Fast Lane, in Bangkok, Paris, uh, Thailand, um, you know, Tokyo, any of these, uh, it's really big in Korea. Uh, then you will here in the States, which is quite interesting. But, um, you know, just to tell your readers, don't be, a, don't be afraid by the title. Um, I've, I hear a lot of people like, the, the Millionaire Fast Lane, that sounds, you know, that sounds cheesy. That sounds get rich quick. And the truth is, um, get rich quick is very real. Uh, and I think a lot of people don't understand that. Um, what they usually confuse that with is get rich easy, which does not exist. But um, there's plenty of billionaires who are 30 years old and, you know, multimillionaire, nine figure entrepreneurs who are in their 30s, even in their 20s. What's that tell you? That tells you get rich quick uh, does indeed exist. Absolutely. And, and the word quick can be defined different ways, right? It's not a weekend, sure. right? Oh, yeah. I mean, um, for me, quick is less than 10 years, right. um, you know, five or even five or six. Uh, you can just change your life in those five or 10 years so quickly when you're leveraging entrepreneurship. Um uh, a fast lane sense framework uh, for your business, as opposed to the standard systems that culture wants you to follow, which is, you know, get a good job, work the five days, save, give your money to the stock market, and just try to be patient. And things will magically happen after right. 20, 30, 40 years. I fell into that. I yeah. fell into that for sure until about four years ago. So I can, I can attest to, the, to that. That's the way we're brought up. I mean, that's what we're trained to do. So, um, can you share a little bit on your story on how, you know, you, you have a really unique story that led you to writing that first book? Sure. I've, I've been an entrepreneur for uh, 30, 35 years or something. Uh, unfortunately, that's going to age me a little bit there. To your <laughs> I'm audience. 51, so I'm, I'm oh, one okay. of the, old, we're, we're, I'm one we're of the older ones that I talk to. I have a lot of younger people that are, I'm like, I wish I started back then, you know? Yeah. Um, so we're, we're pretty much the same age. But when I was a teenager, uh, I saw a, a Lamborghini uh, Countach white and it was um, outside of a store, uh, ice cream, sh ice cream shop. And I was amazed that the owner was a young person. So, um, you know, and that car was like my absolute 
Dream. Oh, it was, I had a poster of it. It was just, so when I saw it, I was like, my world was like, and then I had the gumption to actually, when he, when he left the store, to ask him what he does for a living, which is interesting because after I've owned several Lamborghinis and other Lambo owners will tell you that is the most common question you get is, hey, what do you do for a living? Is that um, right? So I did that many, 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 many years ago. And he said he was an entrepreneur, um, which struck me as very odd because you know, you see someone who's 25 years old driving a six-figure car, which back in 19, I don't know, 80, 80 something, um, it, it, you think, oh, this has got to be a celebrity. He's, he's a soccer player. Right, absolutely. Plays pro ball. And when he said he was an entrepreneur, that threw me for a loop. And that's when I decided, because my family was not rich, we were lower middle class, we were always struggling to get the bills paid, get food on the table, that convinced me that that's what I want to be um, because I don't want I don't want to have this life of getting up five days a week Monday through Friday at 5 a.m. in the morning and have no chance of a real you know affluent lifestyle um, so that led me to study um, entrepreneurs who were you know who were rich um, who were successful and the key element here was in that they were young um, and that's how I really came up with the sense framework. Um, and how, how did you research? How did you research those those young? Uh, well, at the time, it was it, it was mostly magazines and books. Gotcha. Because uh, there was no internet back then, or right. sometimes it would be articles um, in the local newspaper. Today, uh, there's so much out there. There's there's books. There's podcasts. There's YouTube videos. There's magazines. There's all kinds of things. But back yeah. then. You, you had to go looking for it. Absolutely. And, and I, uh, I was a frequent person at the library, frequent visitor there. I loved the library. Um, so the, uh, it took me, you know, I graduated from college, did not, did not go, you know, go for job interviews. A lot of my peers were like, what are you doing? You know, you, you get to go, go get a job. I said, no, I want to be an entrepreneur. So it took me about four or five years to actually build something uh, that started making money, that started having exponential returns, um, which, was, which occurred because I, I spotted a need in the particular industry I was working in, which was uh, the limousine industry, which I was uh, operating a small company for an absentee owner. I saw a need in that industry, ended up teaching myself how to code. I built it, um, eventually... Uh, started hiring some employees, ended up selling that company, uh, very, I don't know, 2000 maybe. They went bankrupt uh, a couple of years later because of the big, you know, the crash, the boom crash. I actually bought that company back again, as operated it for another five, six years, made many millions of dollars over and over through, the, through selling it or through the operations, sold it again. And at 2007, I think, I, after I sold it, I was like, hey, you never need to work another day in your life. What do you want to do now? And I knew I wanted to write a book about, you know, everything I learned about acquiring wealth quickly. And that's how the Millionaire Fast Lane came to pass. It was, um, took me, two to three years to write. Uh, and uh, I had no expectations for it. It was just, I was morally, uh, moreover, just scratching an itch of my own that I need to get this off my chest. I need to say this. And, uh, you know, because I saw, you know, at that time it was, you know, the default method was, as the default method is now, is the same old story. You're supposed to go to work. You're supposed to right. wait, give your money to the stock market. And incidentally, I fell into that when I sold my company the first time. I pretty much put all the proceeds of my uh, business sale into the stock market, and I ended up losing most of it mm. because the stock market crashed. And you know, when it, it back then it crashed, it stayed there for a while. Right. So pe people like to say, "Well, you didn't hold." Well, sometimes you can't hold because you have to get the money to live. Um, so that was a very, um, eye-opening experience for me because I don't, that is very popular nowadays. So you hear this fire movement where people live off the stock market. Um, and 
none of those people have lived through a crash or a recession that lasts longer than a couple months. And right. they're going to be in for a rude awakening uh, when that does happen, because it will happen, because um, I believe the U.S. is in a cycle of decline as opposed to expansion. But um, anyway, that's how the book came to pass. Uh, I started a publishing company. I self-published it, which um, was part of me following my own philosophy in that I wanted to control my operation. I want any publishers telling me, hey, you can't write about that. Or, hey, this, this book is not focused enough. Because I had some experts actually tell me that we're in the publishing industry. This will never sell. It's too broad-based. It's too all over the place. And I said, too bad. I'm I'm writing. I'm doing it anyway. I'm doing it anyways. And that's the power of having financial freedom and being able to go into other entrepreneurial ventures that might not be economically viable. Because I can tell you, if I was broke, I would not be starting a publishing company. Right. Um, but uh, so I thank I, you for writing it because uh, I, I loved it. And and I think that it it hits on so many different points that, you know, look, there's all kinds of of people out there that are selling their way to grow wealth. Right. And but what one thing that I like about your book is. It doesn't have to be one way like you it's. And I, I'm a true believer in that. Like, look, my podcast is focused on real estate investing. But if your itch is to start a company, like, go out and do that. You know, don't. But there is another way. And that's kind of what your message is, is there's another way to build wealth other than just putting money into the stock market and hoping and praying. Yeah, and that's why people struggle to build wealth, because they've adopted that default system. Right. And I'm and I'm saying that system is very ineffective, especially since time is the major contributor to wealth building. And your time, your life is the most valuable asset. You will never be younger than you are today. Your time is a depreciating asset as well. Uh, an example I use is if you're 30 years old, Um, that free time you have when you're 30 is far more valuable than the free time you're going to have at 65 or 70. Uh, I just moved uh, to Utah, and it's one of the greatest skiing capitals of the world. But I'm, you know, I'm in my 50s now, and, uh, you know, I probably can ski, but it's going, it would be a lot bigger struggle for me today than it would be if I was in my 30s. Um, so that's right. what I'm talking about is your youthful time uh, depreciates as you get older. So it is so foolish to think to yourself, well, I'm going to wait 25 years to actually get wealthy. And then when you do get wealthy, you don't even spend the money. You just sit around and do nothing because you want to be, oh, I'm a millionaire. But you do nothing. You, right. you buy nothing. You enjoy nothing. That is not the right way to do it. So in the book, you talk about top five money making systems and and those systems are rental computer content distribution resource human resource can you talk high level on you know what you mean by and you also talk about process makes millionaires you know so i think those two things go hand in hand um can you talk a little bit about that and why why do those processes you know make millionaires well, the systems is what is the key to, uh, to key to everything because optimally we, we want to separate our time. Uh, the default construct is trade your time, earn money. And that's what we're trying to get away from. So the, the systems become the surrogate for your time trade. Uh, so if it's a digital system, that means uh, – Perhaps software as a service. You're selling a particular service, and the system itself is the software. So that software earns 24 hours a day, seven days a week, no matter what you're doing, which means it's also earning income no matter what you're doing. Same with rental real estate. Oh, I have 400 doors. Well, every month you're going to get paid regardless of what you're doing because the system is the real estate, is you're creating a system of habitat for people. Uh, so that a book, the, my, the books I've written, they exist separate from me. I have publishers all over the, all over the world. Those are systems that exist separate from me. So the systems is what creates the ability, 
uh, for you to separate your time from the act of making money. Now, the, and another key element of that is what I call a specialized unit. The specialized unit needs the business system. So example, the example I just gave is I own a publishing company, so my book is, my books are the specialized unit, but I need a business system in order to, I guess, activate it. Uh, because you can have a specialized unit and not have a good business system. You can have all the books sitting in a, in a room someplace and nobody even knows that exactly. they're available for sale. Or I mean, how the, many? Or what the value is for them to read it, right? Yeah, I mean, how many people, you know, a couple of years ago, self-publishing was the big thing. So they wrote, they wrote a couple of books, they threw them on Amazon, and they sat there and they, nothing happened because you don't have a business system. See, my business system is my list, it's my forum. My forum has over 70,000 entrepreneurs, close to a million, uh, a million users or a million uh, posts. That's a system. So, so that, you have let a me special... just interrupt there. For, for the listener's perspective, this is a online forum called the Fast Lane Forum that ha is just full of different entrepreneurs that are on there. Correct. And, and you know, it's, it's not just a business forum. I mean, there's all kinds of discussions on there. There's biohacking discussions. There's, you know, do you have kids? Do you not have kids? I mean, it's just, it's about life optimization through Fast Lane entrepreneurship. And that's part of my system. And that's, you know, my book has sold more than most New York Times bestselling, bestselling books. But it's never been on the New York Times bestselling list which is interesting because it sells consistently throughout throughout time. It, there wasn't some big ramp up and then it just dies off. It's because it consistently sells through time because the content in there is evergreen, it's transcendent. It is just as valuable, if not more today, than it was 10 years, a day, 10 years ago when I wrote it, which is why it continues to sell. But the business system, it keeps it into the forefront. So that there's business systems and then you have your specialized units, re rental real estate, apartment buildings, apartment units, re uh, single family homes, those are specialized units. But behind that, you're gonna need a system, you know, for property managers and, and, and billing and all that other stuff. So it's a, it's a kind of a synergy or yin and yang uh, between uh, the two concepts. Between the two. The other thing you say is, you know, success r resides in execution, not the idea. And I've been to a lot of different entrepreneur conferences where they're like, you know what? You don't have to come up with the one idea that nobody has come up with. I mean, look, you, your first business that you talked about was a limo business. How many limo businesses are out there? But if you can do it better and more profitable and have better customer service and get your name out there more, and then you differentiate yourself. Yeah, the, the, um, the concept of value skew is big in my second book and third book. It's not really covered much in Billionaire Fastlane, but value skew is covered in Unscripted and The Great Rat Race Escape. And basically that is stating that you do not need to reinvent the wheel. You do not need to do something that's never been done before. And I think that's a big mistake a lot of entrepreneurs make is they think they have to do that. They have to create the newest no, uh, thing that's never been done before when actually it's all about value skew. If you do one or two things better than the competition, just one or two things better than the competition, you have a business. So if you're thinking, think about the last time you opened up a new relationship with a new company. You opened your wallet and you gave them money. There's a particular reason why that occurred. And usually it's going to be a value skew item. So, hey, they had good customer service. When I asked them, when I sent them an email, they got back to me within 10 minutes. That impressed me. Here's my money. Or perhaps there was a story on the website that um, was able to... Uh, inject an emotion or, or identification with you like oh 10% uh, of our profits save the whales that struck you as something like yeah I want to be a part of that so everything is about value skew a lot of times like with food products it's about your ingredients you have a particular ingredient or even better you don't have a particular ingredient like with me it's 
artificial colors. I won't touch anything with Red 5 and, and Blue 6000 and all these other screwy names. That's a value <laughs> skew when you don't have that in it and you advertise it as such. So you're not about reinventing wheels, you're about improving wheels and making that improvement very discernible because for some people that's going to be the item that makes them say, you know what, I'm going to buy from you instead of buying from, you know, X, Y, or Z. So and a good example is Uber. When they came onto the scene, I analyzed their uh, business model back when it started because it was in this kind of the same field I was just leaving, thank God. Mm -hmm. Right. And they disrupted, they had like 20 value SKUs that were better than taxis. And that's why they're a, a billion dollar company now, although they're not making much money, but which that's usually normal. But they disrupted, you know, 20 different value SKUs, which is responsible for their meteoric growth. If you do two or three, you have yourself a business. Yeah, I mean, that's huge. I mean, Uber, I mean, taxis have been around forever, right? Yeah. And somebody came up with the idea of just having better a better way to do it. And and it's, it's taken off huge. Um, you know, talk to the listeners about, you also say, you know, experience is gained in action. And and I'm a big proponent of that. And in, in that, you know, there's a lot of people that are out there that it, they read books, they listen to podcasts, but they don't pull the trigger, you know? And I think that um, I'm a believer in that God made all of us unique and that, you know, a lot of us have this like burning, you know, thought idea, you know, something in their gut that they want to do, but they feel like it's the safer thing to do just to stay put and in their W2 job. Um, but they, you know, as a person, they want to take a chance. So, um, I don't know, maybe talk to the listeners about taking action and it, it is scary, but you know, the, the people that you've met that are successful at some point, they took a chance. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and, and fear is the ultimate crippler of dreams. At some point you got to stop reading about swimming. You have to jump into the pool. Uh, and, you know, a lot of for a lot of people, that's different. That doesn't necessarily mean quit your job. Right. And um, but it needs to be about setting up a foundation where that becomes possible. Uh, so I always like to say, you know, quit your job when your business makes you quit your job. Uh, so if you have a um, if you have an idea, there's no need you you should not start pursuing it even while you have a job. You know, on the weekends or you know an hour a day after work or before work, and then when that business reaches a, a particular point of inflection, you can say, "Oh, I can quit my job and and pursue something," or you can real or you can plan for that, saying, "You know what? I'm going to be an entrepreneur right now." I don't have time really to be building something right now. So I'm going to save everything I have. So I have a one month runway to create something. And then I'm going to quit my job when I, when I find my idea, it meets criteria. I've researched it. I've done the things and I have one year to make it happen. And if it doesn't happen in a couple months, I have a, have a chance to pivot to something else. So it's all about strategic uh, planning or making, having the business make you, quit your job because it's going to be different for everyone. Some people could just quit their job and say, you know, I'm going to go for it. And the other people, you know, they have kids, they have, right. you know, a mortgage or something. Uh, then it has to be a much more strategic. Uh, and it's, of course, it's very important to have your spouse on board because if your spouse is not with you on it, that's going to be a drag, uh, on your, you know, on your progress. But, um, you know, you have one life to live. Uh, and uh, a big thing I like to say is, what is the worst thing that could happen? You have to go look for another job. Um, and especially if you have a skill set that is in demand, like you're a software developer. Well, if you're a software developer and you quit your job, and then you start software developing on your own business, and then that business just fails, you're not going to have a hard time finding another job if that's what it comes to doing. Uh, or you can freelance. Uh, a lot of people quit their job and they start freelancing. Uh, and, and they ramp up their hourly rate and they end up making just as much as they do at their business, but their, or their, their job, but 
but they're only working 20 hours. So they use that extra time to build their business. That's actually how I got started. I started freelancing to build up capital. Uh, and so as I built up capital, I was able to work on my business system on the side. Uh, so there's so many different ways uh, that you can approach it. But ultimately, you have to dive into the pool and stop with the incessant reading of, of books that, you know, the, the best experience you have is getting in the pool and swimming, not learning, not reading about it. Yeah, I, I love what you said. What is the worst thing that can happen? Um, I've interviewed so many real estate syndicators that, you know, have a thousand, two thousand, three thousand units. And they think back to like their first deal and they were scared, you yeah. know, but they consistently I've heard them say, I thought to myself, what's the worst thing that could happen? Yeah. You know, this deal could completely go south and I could go back and work wherever or whatever, whatever the case may be. Um, but also, what is the upside? Absolutely. And, you know, and which, you know, is a has a better probability of happening. And so when they th think through that, they're like, you know what, this this has a much better chance of having a good result than a bad result. And and I'm going to go for it. And, um, you know, it's changed lives. And I, yeah. I believe that must be the, the best thing about writing your book. I don't, at least I think it would be for me is, is when you hear the stories of how somebody read your book, they took action and it changed their life. Yes. And they thank you for, for that. I mean, that's amazing. Yeah, you can't, you can't behind my computer here as I have a wall filled with stories they're all framed of, you know, I've started my company, uh, you know, and one guy told me he, his company's worth a billion dollars. I mean, it's like, you know, it's just so awesome. I and mean, you talk about the upside. That's what we're working for. I mean, not 24 hours ago, I was, we were, I was in the hot tub with my wife. I was drinking a beer, having a cigar. And I, and I was like, here's to living the dream. And it was like, perfect health. I, I have a, a business that has meaningful, I can do meaningful work. I have my time, you know, I have loved one. I mean, it's just, I cannot think of, you know, the idea of getting up at five in the morning and not coming home till six o'clock at night. So you can repeat that for the next four days. Right. Um, and then, then, and then the work is not very enjoyable. You're not doing meaningful work. And here's the thing is when you have a business, no matter what it is, it will be meaningful to you because it is your business. It's like when you have a child and, you know, you don't care if the child, you know, has developmental disabilities or is, is you know, ugly or something. You love that child. And that's what entrepreneurship really is. And, you know, you can be selling deodorant or razors or something that just... It's not very sexy, but you can be passionate about it. You can be passionate about what it's doing for the people that you're helping in your particular industry. And that's another uh, uh, mistake entrepreneurs make is they think they have to do something they're passionate about, like passionate in like with an industry Aha, where man. all you have to be is passionate about the results of whatever you're delivering, a pooper scooper business. Hey, if, if I had 20,000 houses around Salt Lake City and I was picking up the poop around their house and, you know, I had employees who relied on me and, and I was providing a good service, I would be passionate about that. I'm not passionate about poop, but I'd be passionate <laughs> about not. the results right. Right. And, and, and the meaning I'm creating for my customers. And that's... There's a big difference there. I think people get lost in the in the trees with that. They think they have to, oh, I'm going to be a fitness trainer because I love fitness. Well, then, then they end up competing with 20 million other personal trainers, and it becomes a race to the bottom for the cheapest price. And that's that's not a type of situation I would advocate. Right. And, in, and then on top of all that is that, you know, if you look at those two scenarios, say you work for, for another company at W2 and you make good money um, and then you, you know, for 10 years, say, and then you build a business over 10 years. Well, when you leave that company, you do you get unless you get some kind of parachute, you know, thing on your way out, you get nothing once you leave. 
but you build up a business, you can sell that business has value. And if it's profitable, you can sell that business for a multiple of, you know, that you, you actually have built value that you can, you can exit yeah. on. And that's, that's what I talk about in the millionaire fast lane, uh, wealth acceleration factor. Uh, you know, where can you build wealth at a factor of 10? So if you're in an industry that has a PE of 10, if you raise the profit of your business by $10,000, you've just created $100,000 in enterprise value. That's a net worth increase. So that's incredible. If you're doing a million dollars a profit in a year, you have a 10 million valuation. If you raise that to 2 million, now you have a $20 million valuation. How can you build wealth that quick anywhere else? The stock market, you're hoping for 8%. With right. business, you enjoy asymmetrical returns. I started my company at 900 bucks, made tens of millions of dollars. 900 bucks, asymmetric returns. That, that's what that is. Instead of making 8%, you're making 8,000%. And a business is the only way you can do that with asymmetrical returns. Yeah, and and you know a lot of the listeners are are real estate investors, and and you know you buy, buy an apartment community that is in itself a business, right? Yep. You've got you've got rent, which is the income, and then you've got all these different expenses, and then you have net profit, net operating income. So um, that is another form of of business. So talk about, um, you, you kind of hit on it, but you know, with businesses and with real estate um, leverage, you know, if, if you pick something, you know, pick something to do that is going to have those sizable returns, right? And in order to do that, you need some leverage in, in the business or in the real estate or whatever you're doing. Yeah, for me, uh, leverage is not really about debt or, you know, good debt. You know, on uh, real estate properties or apartment complex, it's it's about the leverage inherent in the product or service you are offering. Uh, so, if a good example I like to say is, you know, when you're starting your business or when you're pursuing a particular idea, fast forward to the day you do ten thousand ten thousand either ten thousand dollars that day or. 10,000 units, 10,000 units is probably better. Um, but fast forward to that time, that great time, oh my God, we sold 10,000 today or 5,000, just a large number. What would your business need to look like for that to happen? So in a couple of cases, it's okay, well, not much. Uh, we probably need another employee or two, um, or it could be totally radically different. Well, I need about 50 employees. I need about 20 locations. I need this, this, and that. And that, that to me is about the leverage. What is the leverage of the particular product or service that you're offering? And I'll get a great example in my life is uh, I've, I've partnered with another developer uh, on a particular uh, software service in the publishing space because I'm a publisher. I see opportunities in the particular industry. And this particular service would have been a two-sided marketplace. So when I perform that analysis on um, that particular service, and we do 10,000 uh, customer orders in one day, the business would have had, probably would have had to have six or seven employees, a, a 24 hour seven call center. I mean, it was just a, it was a big minutia of things as opposed to I'm um, also working on another service, which is a goal system productivity, productivity, productivity system. When I fast forward to that 10,000 unit day, it's a different story. I would probably only need one employee. Uh, there would be no call center. So there's two different things there. So for me, I'm going to put my effort in the other business because it has far better leverage um, on it. So leverage is usually about the scale of the product or service you are offering. How easy is it to mimic the product you are offering? I'm not talking about how easy it is to get into the business. That has to be hard. But once you design and develop whatever product or service is it, how easy is it, is it to scale up to 500 units, 1,000 units, 1,000, 10,000, million? 
That to me is where fast lane entrepreneurship, fast lane leverage comes into comes into play. And you want a story is my my brother in law um, owns a restaurant, little little breakfast cafe. And I hear the stories of he's he, he's always at work. Even when he's off work, the employees are bothering him. Um, you know, and, and there's never there's never going to be a day when he's got 20,000 people outside his door right. wanting steak and eggs. Um, so he's put himself into a box of no leverage. Um, and not only that, his time is being sucked dry and, his, and not to mention his, his life force because he's constantly being badgered by his employees. So that's a, that's a situation um, that I would never advocate anyone get into. Um, and another thing is, I guess he got into that business because he was following his passion. Well, his passion for that now is gone uh, because he's so tired of it. And that's the danger of getting into these enterprises that have no leverage. You're following passion instead of following market needs. I mean, there's just a whole thing, a whole lot of stuff there to unpack. Yeah, I, I think that's that's an awesome example because for, for a lot of people, I think starting up a restaurant or a bar is like something that is is appealing in their eyes, right? And But before doing it, I think it's very smart and wise to think about the leverage and think about what that will look like to be successful. And, you know, is, is it just one store, you know, one location yeah. or is it something that can be franchised across the country? Like what, where does that leverage end up bringing the, the returns? Yeah. You know, or that's how you, you get, go that's ahead. how you bring leverage into a cafe or into a, a restaurant is through chaining and franchising which is a total different, you be, instead of becoming an operator of the business, you become an operator of a system. Right. Um, so that's a whole different ball game. And, you know, as far as I know, he, the last thing that he wants to do is own another restaurant, right, <laughs> whether it's right. changed. But that's a different approach as opposed to, I'm going to hire a general manager, get me out of the weeds on this, and then I'm going to start duplicating and systemizing. Uh, so it's all about your your framework for uh, when you're approaching these business systems as how you want to attack them because ultimately hey business is hard as hell if you're going to start a business you want it to change your life you just don't want it to pay your bills you right. want it to change your life you want to be able to spend 20 hours a week working or 10 hours a week working and the rest with you know doing whatever you want or pursuing things that you know may not be uh, monetary economically advisable or economically favorable yeah, I mean, and I think about franchises. I mean, there's a ton of franchises to, to buy, and I'm interested in your, your take on this. Um, you know, when I hear people saying that they're looking at franchises, I'm thinking to myself, are you looking to buy one location and then you're going to work in that location? Then you're buying yourself a, you know, a low-paying job. Or the only people that I've seen really successful, I mean – successful in your definition where they're they're out of the weeds is they go into it saying you know i'm gonna i'm gonna end up buying a, a locate a geography and i'm gonna put 10 or 20 locations there and i'm gonna have somebody else manage it and i'm gonna oversee it and you know i think that those people can be successful in my mind um, but the ones that go for one location, I feel like they're buying themselves a job. But so what's your take on that? I totally advise against franchises. Completely. Buying them. Buying them. Um, I advise you selling them. You want to be the seller of franchises, not the buyer. Right. Now, there's some exceptions. Uh, McDonald's, you know, some of these high, high-end high brands. Well, if you want to buy a McDonald's franchise, you're pretty, you probably got a million dollars laying around. Um, so yeah, I, I do not because, I, because just what you said, you are buying yourself a job. Now, if you, if you have the capital to get a higher end franchise that has a proven track record, a Starbucks, I mean, I don't even know if they, they franchise Starbucks, right. but, and your, your idea is to put two or three of them around, around the community or the city. Yeah, that's that's a fast lane ideology. But typically, buying a franchise is the last thing I would ever advise someone to do because you're buying yourself a job. You're creating the fast laner is the person that sold you the franchise, not the person <laughs> right. who bought it. Right. Uh, so, 
like again, with my brother-in-law, if he wants to be a fast laner, he has to systemize his cafe, get operations in place, get him out of the weeds, and then you start selling franchise based on a unique concept or brand. Then you, then you become a seller of franchise, not a restaurant operator. Uh, and that's, that's the whole idea of the fast lane. You want to be king of the hill. You want to be the, you know, the shark in the, in the tank. You don't want to be the guppy. Uh, as I, I look at, you know, if you're buying a Quiznos, a Quiznos, I don't think they even exist anymore. But, you know, a little sandwich sh franchise, you're, you're, you know, you're basically buying a job and you're being, uh, a sh uh, you have a patriarch, which is the, the franchise owner who's probably taken royalties, probably has some policy dictations. It's, it's, you're buying a job. Yeah, absolutely. I, it it kind of goes back to in the beginning when you were talking about the Lambo and you walked up to the guy and said, you know, what do you do for a living? Like, you know, you want to be the guy that people come up to and ask. You don't have to have a Lambo to do that. But if people see you that it could be just that, hey, look, you're at every one of your kids' practices, you know, when, when other parents are can't be there, you know, um, because they're working. It could be that, you know, you're, you're playing golf a lot or what, whatever the case may be, you have free time. Um, or it could be some material like you have a beautiful house or beautiful cars, but you know, people that are younger, how'd you do it? You know, and, and you want to be one of the ones to be able to explain, you know, this is how I did it. And, and your book, The Fast Lane, is right on with where, where you get to be headed. Pretty much anyone that comes to my house, uh, uh, I just had an electrician here a couple, a couple of days ago, a window washer. Pretty much anyone that comes to my house asks me, what do you do? And, and I just, I can give them a book. Say, well, here you go. You want to know? And not only you learn what I do, you can mimic what I do right. and repeat the same results. So when you say that repeat the same results, I think that like, you know, listeners, you know, whether it's real estate or starting a business, you don't realize it at the time. Just like MJ, right? MJ, when he was building his limo business, he didn't realize it at the time. But later on, he has a ripple effect. You know, he builds that wealth and then other people want to know how he did it. And then all of a sudden he teaches other people and he did it through writing books. Yeah. And and I, go ahead. I, I want to I want to specify also yeah. that that's all I do. I own a publishing company. I write books. I don't hold seminars for $20,000. I don't sell coaching programs for $5,000. I don't have any of these big tickets, you know, upsells i when you read my book there's nothing else to buy not before not during and not after in other words for 10 bucks which usually you can find my book for 10 bucks 15 bucks whatever you can absolutely change your life and there's nothing else to buy from me in fact most of the time people steal my book you know because <laughs> you can find it on the internet probably for free somewhere um so uh i've probably had over 10 million readers but not 10 million buyers uh but um uh, yeah, and, so, and that's and that's and that to me was important because I said when I was struggling, there's always a seminar for five thousand dollars, and you need to raise your credit cards and, and and go to the you know and sign up if you're serious. You need to spend the money. I'm like, if you're so damn rich, why is it five thousand dollars? You know, and the book would always be lacking some kind of information or. Well, if you want the real secret, join my seminar, uh, you know, or visit this link. I don't do any of that. My books contain everything there is to know. There's nothing more to get access to because I've, I, I spill it all and it's all there. So that was one of the frustrations for me as a, as a young person. And that's something I wanted to solve. Like, you know what, if you want to know the secret, it's not going to cost you $2,000 in a weekend in some hotel ballroom. It's... 10 bucks, or if you're diligent, it's free because you'll find it on the internet for free. Right. And that, look, that's admirable that that's your, your take. And I think that, you know, I think I would come at it from an angle of there are, I think there's some seminars that, yeah, they're expensive, 2,500, 5,000, whatever the, it costs, that if you go there and you take action, you know, you learn something and you take action, it can be well worth the money. And then there's other times where people go and they, they spend money that they don't necessarily have 
they go, they don't take action, and it just ends up putting them in a worse position than they were in before. So, um, but I think it's extremely admirable that one, you took two to three years to write it, and you're not looking for anything more. And these people, I mean, you get the joy. You look, you make money on the book, but you don't make a ton of money on the books. Um, and but you get the joy of those letters that are on that wall, man. And I think that once you hit financial freedom and time freedom, what more is there than helping somebody else yeah. in life? I mean, that's huge. That's so, a that's I, a big thing on my forum as well. Is there's some people there that are like, you need more, more, more. You know, level up, level up. And I'm like. What do I need to level up? I mean, um, uh, you know, I, I live in a huge house. Is it not big <laughs> enough? I mean, right. I need a 15,000 square foot house, not 13. I need a, not only a basketball court, I need a volleyball. I mean, what else do I need? So right. at some point, there becomes a, a, a leveling off there where you say, you know, it, it's not about me anymore. It's about other people and about spreading you know the knowledge so but one thing that i like is that there, there are some people that are in your same boat okay um but they don't put themselves out there they don't write a book they don't get out on social media to tell people how to do it they don't you know have some kind of training session they learned how to build wealth and they're now sitting back not not doing anything and they can do that. It's their, it's their money and it's their returns and mm -hmm. that's fine. But I really admire people that made it and they're out there trying to teach other people because once you teach somebody else, then they can teach their circle and it can just have this huge ripple effect. So, we t we're talking about the millionaire fast lane because I read, I read that book. Talk to me about the other two books, um, unscripted and the great rat race escape. What are the, each of those books focused on and how are they different than the millionaire fast lane? Uh, unscripted, uh, the millionaire fast lane is kind of like a business philosophy with some life stuff speckled in. Unscripted is about a life philosophy through business, and that's about not following life scripts. So it's a little bit more. It's a little bit more detailed. Um, it goes into some of the concepts we discussed here today. Uh, value skew, which again is not really covered in the first book. Um, more of the minutia in the process. Also about how to. Um, Live on the wealth you've created while not subjecting yourself to financial ruin due to a stock market collapse or some information there and that, some investing stuff. Um, again, it's, it's a pretty broad-based book that a normal publisher would say, no, no, no. And I say, yes, yes, yes. Um, that book has done real well, um, obviously not as well as the first book, but it's done really well. People, I think people like that one almost the best. Um, because it is so detailed. The Great Rat Race Escape is practically brand new. It's only been on a couple months. That actually is a story. Um, it's, a, it's a half fiction novel where you get to witness a young couple with a baby on the way, kids, and they're in jobs they hate, and they want to escape the rat race. And you literally get to watch them fail and try to build a business using fast lane principles and you get to see exactly how they do it um, and then interspersed in that story i pop in with 120 strategies and principles that apply to the actual story that they're undergoing um, so it, what you're doing is you're witnessing the first two books in action and then i comment uh to you know with the reader if the reader has already read a prior book they get to basically confirm is he talking about that concept here and i yes i confirm that there so people always want to know hey well how is this how is this really applied in real life that's right. the book that shows it applied in real life the great rat race escape so in that book and i haven't read it so i um i, I can't speak to it but the when you interject is it within the story or are you interjecting and saying you know hey here's I just talked about this in the story, and, and here's yeah. the concept. There's, there's, there's the story, 
and there's the story ends uh, uh, or the chapter the chapter ends on a particular item uh, an event a conflict and then i come in and say this is the productivity principle gotcha this is the uh, specialized unit principle and then the story starts again and and it, you go it's interesting because look i'm i love reading self development books and you know books on i'm always trying to i don't know learn something and and get better in life you know um and it's not just financially it's you know be a well-rounded person and and uh but it, i was driving my daughter this morning who's 19 and and she's like you know i said something about the books um you know she always sees me reading and I'm like i like self-development books and she she's like ah oh, they're so boring like i i can't read them like i'm and so I think that there's a segment of people, you know, that, you know, they're not going to pick up a, a book that is just business related. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's really clever and, and a good idea to have a, another book that is, you know, an interesting story. And then you can weave in, you know, life changing concepts within that. Yeah. And that was my intent was to crystallize all the concepts into a different method for learning and it was it was the hardest thing i've ever done because first of all i've never written fiction and then you're trying to write fiction about a couple that's building a business which just sounds very boring so i had to you know spice it up with certain things and and, and character arcs and you know stuff like that that you would expect in a novel um, and just, you know, because the topic itself is just not very exciting, starting a business. Sure. And it, it, it probably so, challenged you, too, because it was a different way of writing. Yeah, yeah. And that's what I wanted to do because I wanted to challenge myself. I wanted to grow. And, and plus, in my publishing company, I want to start writing fiction, uh, mysteries or, I don't know, international espionage. stuff. I, I'm not even sure yet. But I know, you know, my 10-year goal, my 10-year vision is to have a fictional story that actually hits, you know, hits the big screen, you know, Netflix or a theater or something. Um, so eventually that's, uh, that's part of my longer term, uh, I guess, bucket list. Well, that, that's interesting. Cause I was going to ask you like, where do you go from here? Like you've written three books, you're financially free, your time freedom. Um, so what's the next big stretch goal? And, and you said someday you want to, have written a fictional book that ends up on the big screen. Yep. Yep. I mean, I love, I love it when people just keep pushing the boundaries on what you can do. Right. And the thing is, is if you hadn't built that limo company and sold it and bought it back and sold it for another profit, like it, you would never end up having this goal that you that you have right now. And, and that's what I, you know, I try to tell listeners is like, look, you have to take the action step. You can't see where you're going to end up, but it will be much, much bigger if you take action and you take some, some risk along the way. Um, it, like, like you, MJ said, you don't have to quit your job tomorrow. Like you can be doing stuff on the side to build up to that. Um, so what do you like to do outside of uh, writing and outside of your forum and, you know, just for fun? I like the, I, I like cigars and I, I like having a, having a cold beer um, or, or a bourbon. And uh, so it sounds like um, you, you fit in there as well. But uh, what do you like to do for fun? Well, my, my home is a resort, so I, I don't really need to leave. Um, I love shooting hoops. I have a basketball court in my house. Um, uh, we have a theater here. I don't need to a home theater. I don't need to leave to watch a feature length theater, and it's a booming theater, like like he would you know experience at the Cineplex. Um, I have a running creek in the backyard, so I like camping and picnicking <laughs> out in my backyard because there's a creek back there. Um, so I've you know I mentioned you to the hot tub. I was just in the hot tub last night. So my life, my I've set it up so. You know, living in a resort, so I don't need to leave. Um, but you know, when I do leave, I love. Uh, I have an ATV. Love going uh, into the mountains. You know, the trails and getting into nature. Uh, 
just love doing that. I hate putting the, the ATV on the trailer though. Um, so that stops me from doing it as much as I want because I just don't, I just hate, hate that whole process. But um, love shooting basketball. I'm really good uh, usually shooting three pointers, but I can't jump worth crap. And you know? I think <laughs> I have a six inch vertical leap. Uh, and you know, I roll like, my like the up. Phil Mickelson jump after the Masters win, right? He, <laughs> he jumps up and like barely, barely comes off the ground, right? Yeah, th exactly. Um, I, I just, you know, I, uh, I'm exceptionally happy, um, you know, with my life, and it's just, it's, it's, gr it's a great foundation to pursue other things that can make a difference. Um, and I think that's a great place to strive to be uh, because I think a lot of, ultimately everyone's trying to achieve some sort of happiness. Um, and I think freedom, freedom is a huge part of that equation. And, and there's actually been studies that prove that, that autonomy and freedom uh, is responsible for 50% of your happiness quotient. And I absolutely agree with that. The happiest, uh, I wanna say the happiest day of my life, but when, the, when my life became happy, was over 25 years ago when I realized I could be self-sufficient on my own, in my own business, in my own ventures, using my own brain. That's when I became happy because I was autonomy. I didn't have financial freedom then, but I knew I was self-sufficient. So when you're working for freedom, uh, time freedom, financial freedom, uh, th that is just incredibly liberating uh, to, to have that as a foundation for bigger and better things. That's, that's huge. Um, well, I thank you for coming on. Um, your book had an impact on me. I've been, you know, wanting to have you on for a while. I, I, I really ho hope and encourage the listeners to, to go read this book. It's called The Millionaire Fast Lane. And again, he has two other books, Unscripted and The Gra Great Rat Race Escape. Um, in addition to that, he's got an online business forum called Fast Lane Forum. You can check that out. And he also has a YouTube channel with like 50,000 subscribers, you know, so you can look him up, MJ DeMarco, and he's got a YouTube channel. So, um, hey, what's the best way for people to get to know you, to get to know your books, um, you know, point them in the right direction to, sure. to get to know you better? Uh, two best ways are the, uh, the fastlaneforum.com. That's my business forum. It is free to join. Uh, and I am there every single day. Um, literally every single day I am there. Uh, and I contribute. I, I don't, I am not able to ask or answer every question or contribute to every thread. But I usually make five or six contributions a day, uh, depending on the date. So I'm always there. That's how you can interact. I and mean, people come there and say, hey, I read your book. I loved it. And you sometimes 10 minutes later, I say, glad you enjoyed it. Uh, so that's, <laughs> that, that's, that's a, a nice touch, right? I mean, that's a value skew. Uh, yeah. You know, people are like, you know, wow, that's, that's great that right. you, you know. Is that really you or is that some, somebody? No, that's me. Some, no, I know, but they're thinking that, right? Yes, like, oh, is absolutely. That, is that really that you or is that some social media person that's, that's doing that? Yeah, and, I, and when I get emailed, too, I, I do a, I answer a lot of those as well, and I get that same response. Is this really you? And I'm like, yeah, it's me. Um, you know, I can't answer all of them, but, uh, you know, the ones that are, you know, seem urgent or there's something in there that I need to say, I'll, I'll bounce back something. So I'm pretty accessible at the forum. Um, I'm on YouTube at my channel probably once a week, uh, and I do comment there occasionally, but... Uh, in the spirit of my own advice, I focus all my time on my own platform because, you know, YouTube can at any time say, well, we don't like what you said in this video. We're going to cancel your account. That's why I focus my time um, not on social media, but on my own platform, a platform that I control. Uh, and that's part of my sense framework is control. Yeah, that, that's smart. And, and you know, with, with um, any entrepreneur you know, conference I've been to has talked about the value of having your own email list and your own way of marketing to people that want to do business with you. And, um, you know, whether it be a podcast, some podcasters point everybody to, you know, iTunes. Well, if you point everybody to iTunes, they click on iTunes and subscribe and you never even know that they're listening, you know, so you want to achieve some way of con controlling the people that want to do business with you. It's uh, so um, 
the fastlaneforum.com YouTube channel. And those are the two best ways to uh, interact with you. Yes, sir. Okay. Very good. Well, I really, really appreciate you coming on. Um, I am looking forward to reading these two other books that you have and looking, looking forward to everything else that you have coming out. Wish you much continued success. Uh, listeners, I hope that you enjoyed that one. Until next week, signing off. Thanks for having me, Darren. Absolutely. Thank you for watching Darren Batchelder's Real Estate Investing Show. If you liked the episode, please click the like button and subscribe to the show. If you already are subscribed, then thank you. And please share the show with a friend. Check out other free resources at darrenbatchelder.com slash learn. 